here in uh, Brynigsville at 2096 Independent Road in Brynigsville, Pennsylvania. And we're gathered together this morning for worship and we're glad that you join with us. If you're a guest, thank you so much for joining and finding your way to our, uh, our site to gather with us. And our prayer is that your experience with us today will be one that will encourage you that will instruct you, that will uplift you, that will remind you of the goodness of God, the one that we serve and all that he's done for us, and that you will leave here or leave from this gathering uh, having indeed been encouraged for life's journey ahead of you. But please know uh, we're grateful that you've joined us. If there's a way that we can serve you, please, please reach out to us. LighthouseBaptistChurchLV.org, LighthouseBaptistChurchLV.org, and we'd love to hear from you. As we worship this morning, <clears throat> we do want to um, share just briefly a passage of Scripture that I think is appropriate as it calls us to worship from Psalm 95. Come, let us shout joyfully to the Lord. Shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout triumphantly to him in song. This psalm reminds us, of, reminds us to come to the Lord joyfully, come to the Lord with excitement and with exuberance, come into his presence with thanksgiving, and no doubt all of us have good reason to give thanks this morning. We are here. And if for no other reason, the fact that he woke us up this morning and gave us one more day is something worth giving thanks for. So let's worship the Lord together this morning in just a moment. After we pray, we're going to lift our voices in song together. So let's uh, prepare to do that. As, as we pray, uh, just a reminder, uh, as you pray over the next uh, number of weeks, um, <clears throat> Bob Walker and I will be going to uh, Zambia beginning April the 20th to do um, ministry on a mission trip. And so if you would uh, be praying for us as we go, Bob specifically asks for prayer for energy and stamina, for health and for safety, for good rapport with the children, and uh, for good, clear communication with the Zambians, and for faith revival. You can um, remember that in your prayers over the next uh, number of weeks as we prepare for that. And in this season of, as we move toward Easter as well, or Resurrection Sunday, as I prefer to call it, uh, we get our minds focused on the Lord and focused on uh, the great price that he paid for us. So let's stand together. We'll pray and then we'll sing together. Let's stand, please. Our Father, we have come today and we've come into your presence. We are confident that we're in your presence because we've come to worship you. We've come to celebrate you. And you said in your word that you inhabit the praise of your people. And so as we offer ourselves to you, as we offer our lips and our voices to you in praise, as we, as we bow our hearts in your presence, we come so with thanksgiving in our hearts, thankful for one more day's journey. Thank you that the blood is still running warm in our veins that we have the movement of our limbs, though in some cases it may be limited from what it used to be. We're grateful for every step that you give us, every breath that we can breathe. Thank you for reasonable portion of health and strength. Thank you for every day that you've already given us and the hope, the confidence that, that as we live out this day, we will do it to your glory. Thank you once again for bringing us together to this place, for those that are joining us online. And we pray for each listening ear. Some are listening today and they're listening live. Some may get this sometime down the line next week, next year. 
whenever they get it, whenever they hear it, God, we offer this prayer for them as well, that each one will grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, that we each would be reminded that we serve a God who is second to none. You and you alone are God. We worship you this morning and we thank you for every gift that you've given us, not the least of which is the gift of life. And we pray for uh, Bob specifically as he's asked us to and praying for the work in uh, Zambia, praying for the people of Zambia, praying that their hearts would be made ready for what you have deposited in us to share with them and that our hearts would be ready to learn what it is that you're trying to teach us as we interact with our brothers and sisters there and that there would be those who come to know you as a result of what you do through our collective work with the people there, that people would grow, people would be reminded of your faithfulness, that people would be encouraged, that your word would go forth and that it would bring forth fruit and that that fruit might remain. We commit now the, this time to you as we worship you. May every thought, every word, and every action bring glory and honor to your name. For it's in the strong name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we worship the Lord together in singing.
then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus direction thank you that that was me not them so they reminded me so thank you for that um, I w yeah I want to begin pointing us in that direction pointing us on that road uh, toward toward Calvary and uh, this morning <clears throat> I want to invite your attention with me for a few moments to Psalm 22. While you're making your way there, I want to remind those of you that are here as well as those that may be joining us online that following our worship or at the end of our worship, I should say, we will uh, gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. This is first Sunday of April and we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. And so if you get a moment and you can grab something that uh, will symbolize for you the death, burial, and resurrection, his blood and his body, some um, fruit of the vine or a close facsimile or um, cracker or bread or something that represents his body. The, um, the elements are not nearly as important as what they represent. And so we invite you so you can join us as well during our service of, uh, of the Lord's Supper. As we, um, <coughs> excuse me, as we open this text this morning, let me read. Um, and if the Lord uh, allows us, I'm looking to 
revisit this text over the next couple of Sundays, so I'm not attempting to get through this entire psalm today. I will to some degree introduce it, and then we'll revisit it again next Sunday, if the Lord wills. But Psalm 22, let me begin reading uh, in the first verse of this psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest. But you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel. <clears throat> Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man scorned by men and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he takes pleasure in him. You took me from the womb, making me secure while at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God, from my mother's womb. Do not be far from me because distress is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. The dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. But you, Lord, don't be far away. My strength, come quickly to help me deliver my life from the sword, my very life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild Oxen, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will praise you in the congregation. Let me stop there. Verses 1 through 22 of Psalm 22. As, uh, as we look at these uh, verses this morning, we want to think about the suffering that Jesus did for us. See, Psalm, Psalm 21 is really a psalm of thanksgiving and hope for the king. But Psalm 22 is a psalm that graphically for us paints pictures of Jesus' sufferings while on the cross. It is a prophetic psalm a psalm of prophecy, if you will. As a matter of fact, the opening line of this psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You may remember is, are the words that Jesus spake from the cross in Matthew chapter 27, verses 45 and 46 where he cried out to his father these very words. Let me just read them from Mark's gospel. You've heard it before. Just listen for just a moment. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken 
me. Some believe that Jesus may have meditated upon this psalm, or some go as far as to say that it's very likely that Jesus may have even quoted this psalm in its entirety while hanging there on the cross. A reminder that he was only fulfilling the Father's purpose that David many years before had already prophesied this day would come. And so we have recorded, we have recorded here that that Jesus cried these words in Psalm 22, my God, why have you forsaken me? Someone has, or, or, uh, Charles, excuse me, Charles Spurgeon has said about this psalm that we should read it reverently and we ought to take our shoes off as Moses did at the burning bush. His argument is that if, <clears throat> if there ever was holy ground, we are standing there on it now. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Let us, if only symbolically, let us take off our shoes as well, as it were, and see the pictures of the suffering Christ that are presented here in this Psalm 22. As we look at this Psalm, David, the psalmist, presents to us Jesus as the forsaken Lord. Verses 1 through 1 and 2. Jesus as the forsaken Lord, my God, why have you forsaken me? Notice, though, that even in Jesus' great agony, he still has faith in God. Though, though his body is wearied and battered and, and bruised and beaten, the cry from the cross is not merely God, God, why have you forsaken me? But the cry from the cross is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a profound lesson for us, that even when it seems that God is far away, even when it seems God does not hear us. We can still put our faith in the one who is my God. Do you see Jesus suffering? In your sanctified imagination, can you go back 2,000 years with me to Calvary? Can you see his body, his broken Body, can you see him as he hung there? And those words uttered from his mouth, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus in his humanity is attempting to understand why God has forsaken him. Why, my God, my, why have you forsaken me? Oh, he could understand if God would forsake Judas. Judas was greedy and sold his son out for a handful of cash. Maybe he could understand if God were to abandon Peter. 
Peter at the time of crisis, at crunch time. Peter became timid and could not understand and, and could not stand with Jesus. But in all of his humanity, Christ cannot understand why his God, his Father, would forsake him now. He cannot understand why his Father, the one in whom he trusts, is silent. You see verse 2, my God, I cry day and night, but you do not answer. Have you ever been there? When life maybe surprised you with some unexpected event that puts you into a, a spiritual tailspin in agonizing pain for some turmoil that has in, invaded your life and you don't understand why and you cry out to God, God, why? I think about, for example, this past week I attended a home-going service of a young girl, 10 years old, who died from leukemia. Had been in the hospital for months. A girl who, to watch her and to hear the testimonies of her young life and how she affected others, loved Jesus with all of her heart, Parents who loved the Lord as well and people all around who were praying for her and asking God. And, and I, I, could, I, I, could, I could hear the parents even asking the question, God, why have you forsaken us? Have you ever been there before where the pain of life has been so excruciating that you could not understand God's silence in the midst of it? Somebody has said, the teacher is always quiet during a test. And sometimes there are things that we have to go through as God tries us to make us everything that he wants us to be. There may be times when God seems silent, when God seems to ignore us. Surely for Christ, for Jesus, there could be no greater agony than feeling forsaken by God, the, the second person of the Trinity, God in the flesh. How, how, how could this be? Our minds cannot really fathom the truth of this. How can God be separated from God? How can the Father separate himself from the Son or from the Holy Spirit? This, there is something going on here that, that goes beyond natural human comprehension. You see, something was going on here at this moment in history, prophesied in Psalm 22, experienced, as we read earlier in Matthew chapter 27, that all of the sin of all of humanity was being poured out on Jesus, the Son. The sovereign one was in heaven. The saving one was on earth. And for the first time in human his history, God could not look at his son as he bore the sin of the world on his shoulders. All of the sin from Genesis through Revelation, all of history, was being bore in his body and in his blood. And you hear him crying, why have you forsaken me? There's a sense at which at this very moment, God seems so far away. Do you hear him in the B section of verse 1? Why are you so far away from my deliverance? 
and from my words of groaning. Yes, God seemed far away, but can I tell you a secret? Even when God is silent, God is not far away. Even when God is silent, it does not mean that he does not hear us. Jesus is in tremendous agony, hanging there on the cross. But it doesn't mean because God has not spoken that God has not heard. Jesus, as he hung there, believed that God did indeed hear. But he didn't take away the suffering. And although Jesus did not receive the answer that he was praying for, did not get the answer that he was seeking, he still prayed. You see, he took his own advice. Remember, in Luke chapter 18, he said, he spoke that parable to the disciples that men ought always to pray and not faint. See, sometimes you got to pray through God's silence. You got to pray through God's apparent distance from us. Because there are some things that God wants to do in the hard places of our lives. There are things that God wants to do as we go through difficult times. As a matter of fact, in the very next Psalm, Psalm 23, David reminds us, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil because you're with me. That didn't mean David sensed God's presence, but that David knew that God was present even when he couldn't sense his presence. When he couldn't feel his presence, when he couldn't understand it with his five senses, there was something down in David's spirit, down, down in David's heart, something that had been deposited inside of him about God that he would never leave him nor forsake him. And you, beloved, God hadn't left you in your pain. God is not distant from you when you suffer. God is not ignoring you in the hardships of life. Though we see Jesus groaning. And for my words of groaning, why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? He's in tremendous agony. That word groaning is a word that it, it, it really means like the roar of an animal. A, an animal in distress. He said, I'm, I'm, I know I'm sounding like an animal in distress, but indeed he was in distress. He, he was in such distress so much suffering that they're not even words sufficient to express the grief that he was going through. He was forsaken by his father. The second thing I want you to notice in this text today, you would pick up in verse, uh, verse 6, but I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let the Lord deliver him since he takes pleasure in him. The words of our suffering Savior, he says, he was like a worm, not a man. How, what a far, 
leap he takes from a man to a worm, what reproach, how despised that Jesus is compared to a worm. What is a worm? Helpless, stepped on, despised. Bait. No one cares about worms. If he said he was a dog, at least people keep dogs as pets or a cat, but not too many, not too many that I know have pet worms. How much can you be despised? What language could communicate it any better? When, when was the last time any one of us lost sleep over a worm? says he's like, like a worm. I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks at me. Can you imagine? He's hanging there on the cross, despised, as insignificant as a, a human life could be, unrecognizable to see him, after having been beaten, described by that term, worm, ridiculed, ridiculed by the scribes and the priests, ridiculed by that thief on the cross. What kind of Messiah is this? Could he really be dying? Is he supposed to be the deliverer for Israel? Is this your hope? Is this the one that you had trusted in? Let him rescue himself. Let him deliver himself. You can hear the ridicule of that crowd. You can hear as they mocked him, as they laughed at him. He never said a mumbling word. And Isaiah says that he was wounded for our transgressions. That's why he didn't get off that cross. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. That's why he couldn't quit. That's why he could not come down. That's why he put up with all of the ridicule. That's why he put up with being despised and rejected. That's why the physical pain that he endured did not cause him to give up nor give in because he had something far better in mind. Wounded for us, despised for us, battered for us, shed his blood for us. He's a ridiculed Savior. You see, everything that he did, all that he endured, he was forsaken by the Father. He was ridiculed by those who saw him, those who watched him. And as we make our way through the rest of 
this psalm as the Lord gives us freedom to do so, you'll see that yes, he endured a lot, but you'll see the stress and the strain. You'll see his emotional struggle as we work our way through this psalm. You'll be reminded, yes, of his suffering, but you'll also be reminded of his faithfulness. Let me quickly just say, as we look at the extremity of his misery, verse 14, look at it quickly. I'm poured out like water, all my bones disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. Gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I count all my bones. People look at, stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. You see his extreme misery. Poured out like water. You see this contrast on one hand Feels like he's been poured out as water, and at the same time, he lives with this tension of his strength being dried up like baked clay. Psalmist, I believe, is trying to show us these extremes, that, that on the one hand, he's poured out as if that could solve something, that could quench something, and yet it reminds us that the one being poured out is dry like clay. The one who was described as the living water offered to others that if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. That one, unable to satisfy his own thirst as he hung there on the cross and his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth said, I can count all my bones in verse 17. Count all my bones. Can't imagine the pain of hanging there on the cross. And eventually your muscles are no longer strong enough to even try to support the weight of your body. And there's no strength left even to take your breath. And so eventually you suffocate because you don't have the strength to lift yourself in order for your lungs to breathe. And you ultimately suffocate hanging there on the cross. If you don't first bleed to death as a result of the piercing in his hands and in his feet and in his side and, and the blood running from his brow. By his body ultimately and finally it gives in. It gives out, but not until he's ready. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou mightest ransomed be and quickened from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? Jesus gave his life for you. Have you given yours for him? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the suffering servant, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For us, he died. For us, he was crucified. He gave his life for us. And so, Father, as we see the suffering servant, the one who sacrificed it all for us.
May we, as the poet reminded us, now give our lives for him. We can never repay you for what you've done. But we can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. Wholly acceptable unto you, and that's a reasonable act of worship. And Father, would you remind each of us that if we were the only ones on earth, that he still would have died. That your love for us is so great that it's not just about the corporate offering of new life to everyone but the individual offering of life to me all by myself. He died for me. And so would you remind us and cause us never to forget in the celebration of the resurrection that we can never get there apart from the crucifixion. Pray that you would save the one closest to destruction. In the name of Jesus, amen. It seems appropriate at this time as we've talked about his passion, his death, that, um, that we move post haste into celebrating together this Lord's Supper. We'll read as we do, as our tradition is, our church covenant. We'll do that together, and so I invite you to stand as we remember that our commitment to him is insignificant in comparison to his commitment to us. But he does call us that since he died for us, that we ought to give our lives for him. Part of that has to do with certainly our relationship with him, but a part of it has to do with our relationship with, to each other. And uh, in the church covenant, we are covenanting, we are committing, we are, um, we are, we are uh, making a statement of our intention to relate to each other in a particular way. And the covenant spells some of that out for us. So let's read it together. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus as our Savior. And on the having been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do the presence of God and this assembly enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ to contribute to the support of the ministry mission of this church through stewardship to encourage family and personal devotions and to educate our children in the faith of Jesus Christ to walk respectfully in the world be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior amen you may be seated Psalm 22 reminds us of his great suffering. And when Jesus was here on earth, he sought to prepare his disciples for that suffering that had been prophesied. And while he was there in the upper room with them, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to them and he said, take it, eat it. This is my body given for you. And he took the cup likewise after he'd given thanks gave it to them and said, this is my blood in the New Testament. And every time you do this, he said, you show my death until I come. And so we've come to that sacred hour now where we remember his death. But not ju just his death. See, when we gather together for this Lord's Supper, 
we do look back at Calvary, which is where he died. And we remember Calvary, never forget. Lest I forget Gethsemane. Lest I forget your love for me. Lest I forget your agony leading me to Calvary. Can't celebrate the Lord's Supper without remembering Calvary. But then he said, do this until I come. Which means just like we're looking back at Calvary, we're looking forward to the one of these days when he comes back for us and consummates all that he'd planned, consummates all of human history as we know it, snatches his church, takes us home with him. It looks back, but it looks forward. But then he said, now don't forget where you are in the moment. He said, before you eat and drink, let a man first examine himself and then eat and then drink. If you eat and drink unworthily, you'll eat and drink damnation to yourself. For just a moment, would you quiet your hearts in the presence of the Lord? You have a conversation with him. He knows your heart. There's nothing hidden from him. You can't pretend. He knows you are naked. Your heart is naked before him. If there's anything between you and God to settle, would you do that? Before we take of the Lord's Supper, if there's anything between you and your brother, would you say, Lord, hold, hold, I can't do this now. Let me settle what I have with my brother and then come back to this table. You take a moment you and the Lord, and then I'll lead us in prayer. Father, as our hearts are quiet in your presence, as we look back on Calvary, What a gruesome death. But you did it for me. Lord, thank you that you didn't quit. Thank you that you endured it for me. Thank you that you were committed to the Father's will in spite of what it cost you. And so we remember that and as we press forward until you come, would you look on us right now and if, if and whatever it is that is unlike you, we lay it on the altar, we confess it and we claim the forgiveness that's ours because of your death. We don't want to be presumptuous about it. We don't want to heap damnation on ourselves by holding on to that which you've told us to confess. So, Father, we confess what we know and we ask you to take care of what we don't know. Some ways we've offended others we may not even be aware of. Some ways that we've offended you. That in your own graciousness you've not brought to our attention. But Lord, we, we leave on the altar every offense, every sin, every hardship that we've created, that we've done, every thought, every action, every attitude, we give it to you. And Father, take these elements, they're natural elements, we know that. They're used in this holy service, but I pray you would sanctify them fit them for your use. They represent something. They, they are not your body. They're not your blood. We recognize that, but they, they represent something very precious to us. You were wounded for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. 
chastisement of our peace was upon you and with your stripes we're healed. God, continue to heal us. For life has us broken. Continue to heal us because we were born and shaped in iniquity. Continue to heal us because we live in a broken and a flawed world that influences us. Continue to heal us. And with every passing day, make us more like your son. So these elements we commit to you, our lives we commit to you. Meet us as we commune with each other and with you in the name of Jesus. Amen. His bread, this bread, it represents his body. Let's commune together with each other and with him. Eat all of it. Thank God that even after 2,000 years, his blood has still not lost its power. That even today, by his blood, lives are being transformed. By his blood, salvation is still being offered. By his blood, men can still be made new. Let's celebrate that as we drink that which represents his blood. Drink all of it. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see. Now, Father, we have been the church gathered and we're about to become the church scattered. Renew us, refresh us, and send us back out into the world to represent you everywhere we go. Cause us never to forget your great suffering for us. And may we return thanks to you as we walk in obedience to your word. And so now may your grace and your mercy and your peace go with us until we gather together again, either on this side or in the world to come in everlasting life. You keep us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to greet each other.